Hello, welcome to Walk in the Park. My name is Tony Ingram, and this is uh, June 14th, 2017. And if you want to see all of my shows, walkinthepark.tv, go online. That's my URL, my website, walkinthepark.tv, and see all my episodes. This is a uh, public access series, weekly public access television series in Ithaca, New York. If you want to see all the programs, all the schedule of uh, the different uh, public access programs produced here, go to our website, pegasus.webstarts.com. So I uh, have a full show today. We're going to uh, go, actually it's called TikTok, and um, this week we're going to go to Danby, New York Town Hall to learn about ticks and Lyme disease from Mary Woodson. Mary is a science writer with Cornell's New York State Integrated Pest Management Program, which gives her access to immense amounts of vital information about every kind of creature imaginable. She's also a member of the Danby's um, Conservation Advisory Council. Mary's presentation took place on June 7th, a week ago. So let's just go right into that because it will take up basically the whole show. Of those critters, most likely to help Lyme disease from tick to table, the table being you, I gave you three choices, deer, mice, raccoons. Mice. Mice. Nobody votes for the deer. <laughs> mice. It's, it's, it's the mice. All right, you guys know a lot about ticks already. I can tell. Which critter is the black-legged tick's enemy number one? Possum. All right, who votes for turkey and who votes for possum? Because I didn't hear anyone vote for raccoon. Turkey. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, um, opossum, oh, possums. Uh, <laughs> For those who really are dying to know why, especially if you voted for Turkey, why we blew you out of the water, the reason is, yeah, you know, they scratch around, and if they see a tick, they're going to eat it. But opossums, they can be infested with 5,000 ticks in a season, and they groom off more than 90%, could be as high as 95%, and they eat virtually every blamed one. So are you actually saying, if you have a, a, a nice population of possums in your, in, around your house, of possums, are you going to be tick free? Because they, no. they're such great eaters? No, no. I'm going to use, I'm going to, but at least they're eating thousands of them. That is the black-legged tick. Who knows the story behind why we're not calling it deer ticks, we're calling it black-legged ticks. Anyone know? So, here's why deer tick fell out of favor. It was a case of mistaken identity. The researcher thought that it was a whole new species of tick transmitting this seemingly new disease. Notice I'm going to repeat, seemingly new. Why? <coughs> Lyme disease. It turned out the researchers were wrong. It turns out the tick in question was already there. It was already named. It had a name, black-legged tick. That black-legged tick carries this seemingly new disease. And Lyme has a much longer history in North America and other parts of the world than we knew. But our true enemy is that squiggly stuff. That is Borrelia burgdorferi. And the thing about these loopy bacteria is that there are very few around compared around with your uh, other bacteria. Not all those loopy bacteria, not all 90, are bad actors. Those that are, are notorious. 
Some of them are pretty bad. Syphilis, folks, syphilis is another one of those loopy bacteria. And it was pretty bad. I would argue that Lyme, that Borrelia burgdorferi, BB, might have the chance to become renowned, perhaps with an even worse reputation than the one that caused syphilis. Yeah. And it has something going for it that even its nearest kin lack. And what's going for it? There you go. Manganese. So there's iron. There's manganese. The Borrelia in question, instead of using iron, it snags manganese, which is next to iron on the periodic table, and it makes its enzyme with that instead. So that's a way of the mechanism of getting, of getting past another critter's immune system and causing disease. Because the immune system is looking for stuff with iron. There's the black-legged tick. It's got a bunch of legs, eight of them all together, because it's not one of the newborn larvae, which would have six. It's got what sort of looks like a head there in front. These are really mouth parts. You could barely even say it has a head. There are plenty of ticks that have eyes, which are usually between the first and second legs. This one black-legged tick doesn't have eyes. Its brain is between its first and second legs, if we can call it a brain. But the red stained item in the middle there that you see toward the lower middle part, it has rows of backward curving spines. And there's a groove running down the middle of it. That groove, that channel, it channels the tick saliva into its host, channels the host's blood into the tick. Ticks are some of our among the species of animals that simply, they can't live if they don't have a blood meal. They, they just, they, it's just not possible. They're sort of like bed bugs that way. They can't live without a blood meal. The good thing about bed bugs is there are no diseases that come along with them. Whereas with ticks, oh yeah. That blue stain, those two blue stain things, they're, a pair of long rods, they don't look that long right now, they end in hooked teeth. They can extend all the way out beyond that red apparatus, or they can pull back to roughly half their length. They're also mobile. Their tooth tips can swing out at a 45 degree angle, and they're sort of like a cross between a keyhole saw and a drill press. And they're <laughs> And you're, and you're making this little hole. You're making a little hole in that critter that you're biting. So that's their purpose is to cut into the skin, create an opening for the red stained channel in the middle. And then the pink thingies. Those are called palps. They're sensory organs. They help ticks find approaching hosts. Why did I choose this image? because I recently removed a tick from somebody and I was using a magnifier along with my very best pair of tweezers. You want to use always the skinny tipped ones, not the big blunt ones. And I had the magnifier and I thought I had messed up. I thought that I was pinching the tick between its legs right across its body. And I knew if I did that, I, I'll tell you why later. You don't want to do that. <laughs> I was trying to grasp it between, you know, right, right by its head. And I see the, this thing, this stuff moving back and forth because the palps move back and forth. And then with the magnifying lens, I thought those were legs. Later on, I realized, oh no, they weren't legs. They were the palps, and I was doing the right thing. On the left, we have a dog tick. It's a superficial feeder. On the right, we have a lone star tick, which is another doozy out there, by the way. And 
Lone Star Ticks and Black-Legged Ticks have one th something in common, which is they are deep feeders. So the dog tick on the left, all that black stuff that it's got around its palps, that's a type of a cement, and it's a very superficial cement. The black stuff on, that's also a type of cement. It goes down a lot deeper. And this is why ticks, once they're on you, they want to stay on you. You aren't aware that this tick is on you. It has, it's used it as an anesthetic, basically. Mm -hmm. It is an engorged female tick, and it's just doing what it evolved to do, which is nourish its eggs with blood. What's time to a tick? They go through four stages in their life cycle. They might feed for, oh, a couple of weeks, a week or two at a whack, then they're done. And they go into a sort of a dormancy. It's called diapose or something like that. Um, dormancy, let's call it dormancy. And they stay that way for weeks, months, a long, long time. They could go almost a year without feeding. So as you can see, when the adults are active, they're abundant in October through May. And even when we say October through May, we think, what? What about winter? You know, I used to think, oh, we're having a bad winter. That means there won't be so many ticks next year. Uh-uh, it don't work that way. <laughs> I wish it did. But at roughly ground level where the snow is, if you've got even six inches of snow, usually, unless you have almost no snow and a horrendous winter, it does not freeze very deep. And it stays at about 32 degrees right there. And so if there's a thaw in the middle of winter and that female still hasn't found the nourishment she needs to lay her eggs, then she's going to, you know, if there's a piece of shrubbery around or some old goldenrod stems or something like that, she's going to climb up on them. So here's what you remember. 32 ticks on you. 32 ticks on you means 32 degrees. You better be watching for ticks. You better be dressed right if you're outside. If it's in the 20s, don't worry about ticks. If it's in the 30s, Act as if there are ticks out there because there are and you don't need to get Lyme disease. Typical black-legged tick begins its life as one of several thousand eggs laid by a single proud mama who promptly quo croaks. Yep. And those are the eggs. They're tiny. They're really, really, really tiny, even though they don't look tiny up there. And when they hatch, as six-legged larvae, they are as pure as the fallen snow. They don't carry disease when they're larvae. They need to find a host. They need to have their first blood meal. And it might satisfy you to know that most ticks, once they've hatched, I mean, very few ticks actually make it to adulthood, but oh well, enough of them do to be a real health hazard for us. And that larva isn't much bigger than a pinprick or a grain of sand. Make that very fine sand. So you're not going to see it. Nymph ticks, nymphal ticks are really tiny. The larvae are just, they really are. It's like this, a, a pinprick size. Habitat fragmentation. And it's really kind of an interesting historic. Remember when I said the seemingly rare disease, the seemingly new disease, Lyme disease? Well, it's been here all along. It's been here for centuries. It's been here for millennia. And there's the Northeast is, you know, used to be 95% forest. And there were deer, and there were people who hunted the deer. And there was a very small incidence of Lyme disease. And then the Northeast got settled. And all around Danby, Danby everywhere, upstate New York, all over the Northeast, all over 
the upper Midwest, Wisconsin and Minnesota, all the forests were cut and all the land was cleared and it was nothing but farms, but also the, all the deer got shot. So they were bouncing back from near extinction. And we'd stopped planting, growing, dairying, farming around here because the soil isn't that good. Both mice and deer, deer do play a role in this. They're what's called a reproductive host, whereas the mouse is called, it's a reservoir host. It has lots, it has Lyme disease. It gets Lyme disease. It doesn't die. It lives a full, rich life. Yep. But up there in the upper right, there's a little, cute little mouse. It had just gotten caught, pulled out of have a heart trap. And right in there, yeah, you can't see those little dots, but those are ticks. They're the nymph. They're the, the uh, larva feeding and getting a blood meal and they're turning into nymphs and they're also again feeding them and you know as nymphs and then they become adults so the mice and to a lesser extent the chipmunks and shrews and more than we realized birds birds can carry Lyme disease ticks are really attracted to animals with silky ears so the deer at the bottom those bumps all over its ears, those are fully engorged, some of them female ticks. They are enjoying a blood meal on this deer. The deer is immune, it doesn't, the deer is fine. Yep. The ticks get on a deer or a human being or whatever and they take that last meal and then they're ready to lay eggs and go away permanently. Your house is too, is almost certainly too dry an environment for a tick to live. So they, they need to be in the leaf litter. They need to be where it's damp. They need to be in, uh, in contact with the soil. Uh, we, don't get the, we don't get the ticks after they've been on the deer? No, we do not. They do suggest tossing your clothes. If you have a dryer, toss your clothes in the dryer, put it on high heat, 15 minutes minimum, an hour is often suggested. So if you have a dryer, I, me, I just put them in a bag because they're going to stay dry and the tick's going to get desiccated in a day or two. It's gone. Can a tick, well, a tick needs the reservoir host, so it's a larva. It needs to feed off a mouse or a robin or a chipmunk or a shrew or something like that. And then it hangs out for about, oh, four to six months, more or less. And it just stays there in a semi-dormant place. On the host or no, the on, vegetation? In the veget ground level, ideally. Leaf litter, yeah, because that's where it's dampish most of the time. Now, when, a, when a, an adult tick climbs up onto a piece of shrubbery or onto a weed or something like that, and it waits, and it just waits and waits and waits so patiently. And if it gets too hot and dry, it'll go back down and wait down there some more, and then it'll come back up. And it's always clinging by its hind set of Hind legs, the, the third and fourth hind legs are what it clings with, and it's waving its palps and its other legs out there. It's sensing carbon dioxide from your breath. It's sensing vibrations from movement. It's sensing all these things, and if it senses that an animal is near enough, it's going to try to grab. If we're going to go in the woods, we need to be dressed right. We need to have the right, you know, and you'll be learning later on about how to get permethrin-treated clothing and how to do, you know, the things, how to use the uh, permethrin, permethrin spray for your boots, for your gear, your backpacks, your tent, your whatever, so you can be out in nature. But you've, you just have to, you know, you have to do it right.
Oh yeah, your new best friend, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Give that mama a round of applause because she deserves it. <laughs> Lime is on a growth spurt. It has a toe hold, in some cases a strangle hold on half the counties in the U.S. And uh, about Florida, they Ever, don't ever. quest because it's too hot there. And that's the life cycle. I'm not going to say anything more about it because we've already been yapping too long. And what happened two years ago? We had a staggering number of acorns. So, then the mice. Wow. It's a mast year. Wow. So in 2016, there was this big bumper crop of mice, which coincided very nicely with the ticks two-year life cycle and the ticks in 2017, we are expecting tick populations to basically go into the stratosphere. So I took this photograph 12 years ago. And it never, ever would have crossed my mind that we would be in a world where, where we couldn't just be out in tall meadow grass picking flowers. And we would have thought nothing in those days of playing with our children in the grass, in high grass. It would have been a lovely thing. It was a lovely thing. And those days are gone, you know. There are still many beautiful things to do in nature with our friends, with our children, but we have to be very aware of ticks. Now, deer and mice do very well in the suburbs. The suburbs are a less friendly place for hawks and owls that prey on mice. It's also a less friendly place for foxes and pretty much I mean, foxes, it's their livelihood is eating mice. All right, matches, petroleum jelly, nail polish remover, and a rubbing alcohol, gasoline, kerosene. Why do you not put these on ticks to get them out? The thing that happens if there's either a match involved or rubbing alcohol, something that irritates it, certainly the, the nail polish remover, is you're just pissing them off. And if, and basically you're freaking them out and everything that's in their body goes into you. So that's a very good reason. Just get your tweezers, practice. Dish soap, don't want to do that. So you get your pointy tweezers, you get behind the mouth parts, you pull like that, and those look like big tweezers, but only because they're such tiny ticks. And these are the tweezers you want, and there are other things that people sell for getting ticks out. And frankly, I mean, all the pros say, use the tweezers, use the tweezers, use the tweezers. Yeah. I would go from the side, just like the picture shows you. That's how you want to do it. You want to do it right at your skin. Okay. And you hold it snugly, and you just pull straight. Yeah, it and it can off. take a long time. It right? can take quite a while. And if the head, the so-called head, if the palps and the chan you know, the red channel and all that stuff, the red, the blue, the pink, if they get left in there, it's not the end of the world. They'll come out. It'll be like a splinter that comes out. You know? The bad stuff is in its body. The places that you really need to watch the most, between your toes, on the backs of your knees, your groin, your... Uh, under your arms, along every place, you know, your, your, the hairline. These are all the places that you especially want to pay attention to. All right, these are the two places I go to for most of my information. That top one, University of Rhode Island, Tick Encounter Resource Center, amazing in amount of information. And yes, you can get tick repellent clothing, and I sent mine away 
in a box to North Carolina a week and a half ago, and I am waiting for it to come back because I will be able to wash it. Every article of clothing in there is for when I'm out dealing with, you know, gardening or anything else. And you can wash the clothing 70 times before you need to have it treated again. And you can go to that website and right there, see it says wear tick repellent clothing, insect shield your own clothes. You click a button and it gives you all the information you need. You put your stuff in the mail and you're gonna be good to go. Uh, and lime is a great imitator. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of really serious illnesses that Lyme can mimic, and it could be Lyme or it could be that disease. And you don't necessarily, you can't necessarily tell. Rheumatoid arthritis, meningitis, autoimmune diseases, <clears throat> chronic fatigue syndrome, and some, there's Lyme cardiosis. Don't, only one out of four nymphs has Lyme. One out of two adults has Lyme, gets it before it gets on the deer but you're more likely to catch, get Lyme from the nymph where only one out of four are carrying it because they're so tiny that you don't see them. You're more likely to see the larger ones that are the size of a sesame seed. Okay, so the, that's the presentation about Lyme. Um, I did another show, actually a series of shows a couple of years ago, which you can uh, go to, if you go to my uh, website, uh, go to walkinthepark.tv, then you look for search in the search uh, section, Ticking Lime Bomb. And it's actually a three-part show all about Lyme. It has a lot more additional information that uh, will be helpful if you want to learn about it. So that's all the time we have today. Thank you for joining me. And uh, I'll see you again soon.